um, all this learning, I feel like it's kind of like <laughs> it's it's very much like Steph Curry from three or something, where like you're just you're surprised, but then you're surprised that you're surprised at how awesome, you know, like all these panels have been, all these discussions have been. We've gone through a range of emotions, and uh, now we're about to conclude this mighty, mighty session with the almighty Educolor squad, the team. Um, Manuel, yo, you're telling me I am, I don't even know what to do with today. Like, I'm just gonna, yo, you're gonna see me in the beast chair sometime in August thinking about how Educolor Summer was so dope. So it's great, like great. And now I'm seeing that at 602, so I should probably get into it. You know, something that you should know about Educolor is that I've always said, I am we and we is I. And so, um, I have been so, so honored to have people who actually believe in the work and invest in the work in the ways that they have. And so, of course, in addition to the plethora of sponsors that we've had today, I'd also like to bring up an organizer for one of our sponsors, but also somebody who I really trust in this work, somebody whose voice is both... Um, it's like, it's, like a, it's like a gentle storm in a way, right? So, you know, every word that she speaks ends up like just rumbling and it kind of gets at you and you're like, wait, that she says something real dope. Like, let me let me play that back, right? Um, super grateful to have uh, Zakia Jackson in my circle as somebody who I've entrusted in this work, somebody who's an Educolor member, somebody who um, actually cares about uh, the communities that she works with. And of course, somebody who's a black woman really trying to run things out here in the ways that she does. And she's going to be uh, the person who introduces and does, does a Q&A with our final fabulous speaker of the day. So Kia, please take it away. Thank you so much, Jose, for that introduction. I have to say, uh, and Lorena is a part of this, so that's why I want to say it. Once When I found this community and when I started participating What's up, Manuel? When I started participating in this community, um, it has felt like coming home for me. It has felt like uh, finding a place where I can bring, thank you, Julia, <laughs> where I can bring um, all of my energy and all of my uh, gifts or gifs, however you say it. <laughs> I can bring my questions, uh, my concerns, my my deep fears and my worries. And so uh, during the pandemic of all times is when I first uh, virtually met Lorena and we were in a, uh, a members check in on a Friday evening and in comes this spirit as I perceived her, a spirit, a force that was also tender, that was also compassionate that was holding a kid, maybe two, <laughs> that was talking to us and giving us her attention, but also caring for um, her children. And, and I remember uh, watching Lorena and engaging with Lorena through these member check-ins and just feeling this intense spirit of badassery <laughs> descend right among, uh, amongst us and upon me and have felt so grateful to be able to um, observe and in some ways walk alongside uh, as I have become more and more involved as a member at EduColor. And so earlier today, I tweeted out, man, we need an organ or a saxophone or something because I know she's about to bring it for us to close things out. And, uh, and I will try not to play my harmonica too much, y'all as uh, Miss Lorena gets on the stage here, but I cannot make any promises, so. <laughs> hey, harmonica, I can't wait, I can't wait. <laughs> Zakia, thank you so much for that. That was such a sweet, um, you know, just a sweet little intro and, and a way to share a little bit about the spaces that EduColor creates, right? Because that's what it is. I can be all of myself in those spaces um, you know, educator, but I'm mom and I'm wife and I'm doing all these things. And, you know, I don't have to do that whole, no, we're being professional, which is a whole other conversation. Um, but uh, let's jump in. Let's get in. Uh, so I'm going to talk for a little bit and, and then 
Uh, Zakia is going to guide us in a little bit of a Q and A and just a conversation to wrap up today. What a day it has been! So amazing, you know. All, every single panel, every single keynote, um, each one of them is actually in conversation. There were so many moments throughout the day where I was like, "Oh, I'm like connecting dots." You know what I mean? Like she said this, and then they said that, and then you know, just so, just so, so rich. Such a, a cup filling day. So I'm hopeful that I can try to um, synthesize all of this and um, make maybe even some more connections for all of us. And so the title for today, um, I don't know if y'all can, can they, can they see my screen? Oh, there it is, there it is. So the title for today is We Are Not Blank Slates. That's where we're gonna get started. Considering what a rich day is, it has been, Considering all the things we've been talking about in terms of who we are as individuals, we had young people come in and tell us who they were and who they are not, right? And so we are not blank slates. We are not empty vessels to be filled with information. I know I'm preaching to the choir in that sense. So I am hopeful that um, that's what we can do together right now real quick is just go to church, okay? <laughs> So um, a little bit about me. I am with EduColor, obviously. I'm the pedagogy chair, so I'm very excited about that to continue to do work and, and get us into um, some important actions this year, especially considering this political context that we're in. I'm also one of the co-founders of Disrupt Techs. So go online, learn about us, figure out who we are. We're trying to shake things up in the field of English. Um, I'm also co-founder of Multicultural Classroom. My husband and I started that several years ago um, to just help schools and organizations and teachers with embodying that anti-bias and anti-racist education. How we, you know, like how to bring that into their schools and classrooms. I am also the chair for the National Council of Teacher of English's very long title committee against racism in bias and the teaching of english so um i'm doing that work there and then you know actually before any of those things i'm a mommy and i'm a wife and that really propels all of this work selfishly that's the impetus for all of this right like i'm in it for all of us and i'm really most definitely in it for my three little people the three little people that, you know, um, we get to, to raise. So, you know, as we get started, there you go. As we get started, I want to I want to start here real quick. This is important. What I'm about to tell you is the story of a couple people that are are here on your screen. The first one is Jose Rafael Garcia. This was a man born a very long time ago in Dominican Republic. Actually, all of these people are Dominican and uh, he grew up in a pretty impoverished area of the country. And he grew up to be um, an, an immigrant that came to the United States who, had, who was a civil engineer in Dominican Republic. But once he got here, we know how that worked, right? Then he, he's not an engineer here anymore, unfortunately. But he worked and worked and believed in himself and did not believe the narratives that were told to him or said about him. And so he, at a very adult age, still went and got his master's in the United States in English to solidify himself as a science teacher in public schools. Victoria Eugenia Ramirez, also Dominican, like I said, she um, in Dominican Republic was involved in the Department of Education. She worked in their central offices, like the, like the federal, you, you know, I was gonna say United States, no. <laughs> El Ministro de Educación, so she was in the office. Um, here in the United States, of course, she couldn't practice any of that, right? Um, so instead, she went in a different direction and followed her artistic passions and became a seamstress that owned a whole business. Um, and she was kind of like running the dress streets, if you will, for a long time. Alipio Arnulfo Escoto, he, um, you know, he actually only had an eighth grade education in the Dominican Republic and left school to dedicate himself to make money, uh, to make ends meet for himself and for his family. He learned how to make shoes, repair shoes, beautify shoes, sell shoes, had his own brick and mortar, 
where he took care of people's shoe needs forever. So essentially he became a shoe specialist, if you will. Urania Escoto went on to be the mother of the name you see under that, Adalberto Escoto. And Urania instilled a sense of pride and courage um, and, and fostered curiosity in her children to the point where Adalberto Escoto became um, the founder of the Taekwondo Federation in the Dominican Republic. He also became one of the seven best coaches in the Western hemisphere of the world as he coached the Dominican Taekwondo Federation and those athletes. He then became the president of the, of the Pan American Taekwondo Union. So all of the organizations, national organizations and federations of Taekwondo on the Western hemisphere. And then this, this son of a shoemaker, all right, and a woman who I don't think she hit element, uh, uh, middle school education. This son became the first Latino ever to partake in a world Taekwondo Federation committee. And that committee happened to be the one that established Taekwondo as an Olympic sport. His wife, Jasmine Garcia, um, you know, she did not finish high school, but then bust her butt in the United States to find ways to make money. So she became a professional translator. She became um, a, pro, a, a like certified clerk and worked in the public schools in the district of her community. And through her hands passed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of students, probably thousands actually, that she mentored and counseled and supported as they were going through their lives through the district. So let me tell you, those are my elders. Jasmine and Adalberto, those last two people are my parents. And the other four people are my grandparents, paternal and maternal. I wish that my teachers would have cared to know that about me because that's who I was walking in. That's who I was walking in with. That's who was, you know, in my spirit when I was walking into that room. When Zakia says that she feels my intensity and my energy, I hope y'all see where it comes from now. I hope y'all start to understand because what I didn't touch upon either yet is that actually the first person, Jose Rafael Garcia, he was also part of the, um, the, the underground movement to oust the dictator in Dominican Republic. So there is so much richness in my ancestry. Imagine if we knew what it was for all of our students in front of us. I wonder how my teachers would have treated me differently, how they would have designed lessons differently, how they would have just done everything differently if they would have known more about who I was and then respected me. I wish my teachers would have known about all of us. I wish my teachers and I wish all of these teachers today knew, for example, about Josie in that top left corner how brilliant she is, how much insight she has about what young people really are saying and thinking and doing and believing and what they need, because she could tell them. I wish that they knew about Trenton right there next to Josie and his brilliance and, and his visual literacy skill because of all of the graphic novels that he reads, okay, and all of the cartoons and anime and like all of these things that he does at home with his mother when they're watching TV and different movies. And I wish I wish that they knew about that little girl in the top right corner, that little bean that is a queen, okay? I wish they knew how much she could talk to them and, and even go ahead and teach them a couple things about mindfulness, about self-preservation, about self-elevation, about caring about oneself. And that little boy in the bottom right corner, Ale, I wish that his teachers knew who his parents were, who his mother is, who his father is, and that he's being raised to be a leader to be uh, compassionate, and he's gonna change a whole bunch of things for all of us. We just, we just need to be ready. I hope that teachers knew back then when that little baby Patrick Harris next to Ale, <laughs> when that little baby Patrick Harris, I wish that they knew that one day they'd be learning from him and that he'd be doing PD for them, or that he would be running the podcast that, they're, uh, uh, that they'd be listening to, I wonder. I wonder if they knew. I wonder if they knew that little Jamil would grow up to be one of the leaders of this humongous organization called EduPeller, creating a space 
that in some ways is indescribable for educators all across the country, all across the globe, and in the outer space. I wonder if Marion's math teachers, when she was a child, I wonder if they knew that she was gonna grow up to do all the big things that she's doing. I wonder if they knew that she was gonna write in a way that would move people. I wonder if they knew that she was gonna be a, a, a trendsetter in the math field. And I hope that teachers who have this precious little girl in the corner, this is Bettina Shea's um, young sister, um, you know, I wonder if they know and they can meet her needs. And I wonder if they're able to allow her to give her the space to talk to them because she's been through some things. If you follow Bettina on Twitter, then you know that this young person has been through some things. She could teach us a lot about what it is to fight for and pull for that freedom. What it is to stand in the face of legitimate governmental oppression and, and violence and censorship. She's got a lot to teach us. And then there's my two up there. And my, my hope is that their teachers can see their, their sunshine and their brightness and their power and all of the potential that I see. Let's move, cause I, I can't, I gotta keep going. <laughs> and so I wonder, I wonder what have, would have been different in my education had these educators known who I was and known who the people in my classroom were with me. And that's how you saw in that first, in that first slide, that was me, obviously, with three of my besties, okay, from my besties in high school. We're still friends today and we still talk and we still chat and we'll still remember. You remember that day in that class when that one teacher said that one thing or did that thing to you? I remember because we were witnesses with you, right? We were there in those seats with you. And so I wonder what would have been different in my education? How would have teaching and learning and lesson design and content development, like how would it all have been different? Go ahead and click. And so I realized that I deserved better, that you deserved better, and that the children in our lives and in our families deserve better. And that the students in our classrooms right now deserve better. That was me in the top right corner graduating Head Start with my little cousin next to me in that yellow suit, cheesing. And in that bottom left corner is Jose, Albert, sorry, Jose Rafael Garcia that I talked about at the beginning, my grandfather. May he rest in peace. And so, you know, we... We deserve an education that respects all of who we are and who we walk in with. And so what I wanna offer us is textured teaching. This is the first time I'm really gonna break this down right here in public for y'all, okay? <laughs> um, this, is, this is my answer. OK, this is my answer to how do we teach? You know, a question that that Lisa Delpith posed to us with that wonderful book of hers. You know, how do we teach when the world is on fire? And so my answer is textured teaching. This is how I have taken the stance of culturally sustaining pedagogy and turned it into a framework, a thing. What do I do tomorrow morning? How do I practice that thing regardless of my of my content area, of my subject area? And so my answer is textured teaching. And the word textured came to me from family. I have an aunt Years, years, years ago, she was, you know how aunts be dropping you uh, some, you know, some knowledge, some life advice. <laughs> so she was like, you know, life. And we were talking about life and doing all kinds of things. And she was telling me about the way that a fabric, you know, you're, you might be weaving above. Y por abajo, under that fabric, it's a hot mess because you don't know what's happening. It's colors. It's, everything is going in every direction. But on that other side. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful pattern and it all makes sense. And you'd never know it looks that messy. And so teaching, teaching can be that way too. Go ahead and click. There are four traits. There's four ways to do this. And I'm going to break this down really quickly. Um, just because, just because, you know, I, we just don't have all the time. And, and this is a lot. So there's four traits, four ways to do this. Four, the four things that I think 
we need to do better in schools. First, texture teaching is interdisciplinary. Why? Because we need to stop acting like math can only happen in block one and English happens in block two and science is in block three. And somehow these young people are going to learn what it is, uh, what it's like to understand how institutions come together to form systems of oppression. OK, there is a direct correlation between under interdisciplinary learning, how all these things come together and understanding how how people and actions and institutions come together to form systems. Texture teaching has to be experiential. One of the things that has come up for me today as I'm listening through everybody is the ways that these schools, that education requires that for our survival, we we have a sense of numbness. We have to be somewhat numb. We got to let those microaggressions cut us and just keep going, right? We got to let those statements, all these things that happen throughout the day, the things that teachers say, the things that they don't say, we got to just be numb to get through it. Texture teaching has to obviously not do any of that and push kids, push all of us to feel, to experience the learning, to experience the book. What does this book mean in my life, in this community, in this world? And so I'm, I'm thinking quite literally sensorial, like making learning be physically like a visceral experience. And it also, just so you know, cognitively helps with retention. Texture teaching has to be student driven and community centered. We know this, I'm preaching to the choir. We know this, that kids have to have a say, that kids have to be a part of what they're learning. They can get to choose. Look at us, we're choosing our PD today. We're choosing to be in this community and we're gonna learn better <laughs> and we're gonna retain all this. And it's gotta be community centered. We gotta stop sitting here being in a community where things are happening right outside those doors and we're not talking about them or being in a community where it seems like nothing's happening outside those doors and ignoring the silences of that community. All of that counts. So bringing that very community into your classroom and allowing students to guide some of that process. And then last but not least at all, texture teaching has to be flexible. And what I mean by flexibility is both flexible like in the space, right? So like seating, movement, let a kid go to the bathroom, the world won't be over, right? And then also flexibility in your curriculum. Like, how do you want to show me that you just learned the material? What are all the different ways that I can assess or design or create something, right? So there's got to be a level of flexibility. And all of these traits, all right, um, actually are an antithesis to a lot of the white supremacy culture stuff that we see in schools right now. A lot of the stuff that we've been pointing out all day, right? That whole like capitalist, like super consumer focused and productivity centered approach to education where it's like a factory, you come in, do a thing, pass it and we move on. And like we do this every day. This is contrary to that. So, you know, I'm not asking y'all to create the reinvent the wheel. I tried to do some of that for us. <laughs> so, you know, texture teaching, it's it's what what should have been, maybe. It's what should have been. I'm no longer accepting the excuses that oh those teachers didn't know enough. Oh those teachers didn't, you know, they they um they did the best they could. I I did the best I could. I'm doing the best. I'm trying the best that I can. And as we know, there were teachers then when we were in school that were doing it right. Right. And so we would be foolish to really accept some of these excuses. What could have been should motivate us. What should have been needs to motivate us toward what can be. Because tomorrow, right, there'll be more of us. And so we got to be prepared for these teachers that are coming into the profession to join us, for these students that are coming up in schools. Like we've got to get better as a profession and we've got to move the folks around us or at least do it ourselves for this continuity. All right, for this continuity in our profession. So I am going to stop here. Well, there's one more. Um, go ahead. You can click. Um, I'm going to stop here and I, I can't wait to get into conversation. Um, but this this little picture that you see here, um, this was a school picture in elementary. My mom had sent me in with a dress, but you know, to, to wear for this picture. And obviously I did not, I kept my black turtleneck, which was its own issue, but I'll tell you why I didn't wear that dress. I did not feel comfortable. First of all, going to the bathroom and doing all of that. There's, that's a whole conversation about bathrooms. Um, but also 
you know, I, I knew I couldn't be all of me like that. I, I was not in a safe place to say, here I am in this beautiful dress that my mother chose for me for this picture day. That was, it was not. So I was like, black turn on like it is. I didn't know, but I want to believe that in my spirit, <laughs> it was an exercise of black power. <laughs> um, but it was really, it was really my act of rebellion of like, this principle always got things to say to me. So no, I'm not going to, you know, do this. And I'm not going to do the thing with my hands. I'm going to put my hands right here and I'm wearing a black turtleneck. So it was always there. It was always there, this energy. Uh, but thank you for listening. Thank you for being here with me. Zakia. Zakia, girl. <laughs> Hello. Lorena, thank you so much. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. One more. If anyone else needs a breath, go ahead and take it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm. You know, it's come up a lot today. Um, accountability has come up a lot. The youth really pushed us on accountability, which was wonderful and, and so important. And capitalism has come up um, in various ways throughout the day. I, I think that capitalism separates us from our bodies. And because we're separated from our bodies, we have a hard time connecting to students and each other, right? I'm thinking about the exper- experiential piece that, that you're talking about, the sensorial, mm-hmm. the embodiment. Mm-hmm. How um, have you encouraged other educators uh, and people who are, are with students to connect back to our bodies so that we can lean in with students and so that we can go to a place that we need to go together? Yeah, that's a good question. So, you know, what I'll say is there's this myth that teachers are martyrs and heroes. <laughs> and what I mean is, is that there's a, there's a whole lot placed on us that doesn't belong to us. So I, I am not at all trying to say that you know, teachers are now that were nurses, that were that were yoga instructors, right? That were like <laughs> mindfulness experts. That we're gonna walk people through this whole. No, what I'm saying is mm-hmm. that in order for me to actually say that you are welcome here, that includes your body, mm-hmm. and that your body is a tool of expression, but also for learning. Mm-hmm. And because. You know, before anything else, what, what we do as teachers when we walk into a building, like we're hired to teach a subject. And so I want to start through that, right? Because folks come in saying, I'm a math teacher or I'm a science, I'm a biology teacher, I'm a ninth grade ELA teacher. Cool. Well, then let's start there. How do students body, how can we use that as, an, as, a, as a space for learning, for building, for communicating, you know? Um, and so in, in, for those that are, that don't know, this is, you know, texture teaching is the book that I've written that's coming out. Um, and I, I flesh it out in detail there. And essentially I make very direct connections to, to content area examples. You know, I talk about, I use English because that's, that's just kind of my area of expertise, but it doesn't have to be in English. And I talk about the ways that I have brought books to life, right? Like if we're reading something where, I don't know, something is is happening, um, you know, for example, I talked about Huck Finn and, and reading Huck Finn and understanding like what was going on in that book and the depth of, of the experience. Um, and so I took them to this, this river. I took them to the river, the Colorado River. That's right next to our campus. And, and I said, do you see this river? This is smaller than the Mississippi River. This is where Jim was, mm-hmm. the runaway formerly enslaved person. Like This is what mm-hmm. he was navigating. Like, let's mm-hmm. understand the gravity and the vastness of this. Mm-hmm. And that all of these elements of this type of teaching is what's going to help our young people to really have a, a nuanced, complex, and mm-hmm. deep understanding of social justice. That's what this mm-hmm. is all for, you know? Okay. Thank you. I, I just want to emphasize again what you said at the beginning, because it was something that has been really liberating for me. I don't need to be all things to all students or even to one student. I don't need to be all things. 
I do need to have some connection to my body so that I can do my job, even if it's one thing, right? If I have one job mm -hmm. in order to do it well, I need to be connected to myself. So I really appreciate you um, emphasizing that. Um, as we think about your, your model for textured teaching and the, the four points, the ways or the pillars, the way we, ways that we can show up for students, as you talked about at the beginning when you made everyone cry with the pictures. <laughs> um, could you talk to us about how you, yeah. I think a lot of times we have to fight really hard to get people to listen to us, but oh, yeah. there might be other times where we want to invite other teachers into accountability. Mm. And so it's not this, some people we need to fight. I'm not trying to challenge <laughs> the fight, y'all. I wore camo pants today <laughs> just to be in the right mindset. But, but like, um, I think sometimes also maybe our tone needs to be more invitational. Mm -hmm. how, how do you do that? How do you navigate that going back and forth between those different modes? And how do you encourage others? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's that's tough. It requires discernment. It requires a very um in, like intentional it, it's complicated. So, one, I got to know where I'm at, right? Like if I know that I'm tired today, I'm tired of all of you and and all of this, mm -hmm. today's not the day to check anybody. If I want to keep my job. <laughs> right? <laughs> like today's the day where I just drink something or eat something when the foolishness is happening or I go to the bathroom and practice, you know, passive aggression that way. And then there's days where it's like, okay, I've got the patience today of a monk. I will intervene if necessary. So you got to start with self. And then I think, you know, that you're right, that there is, there is a balance between, you know, I have told this person numerous times, I can tell that they're in fact not integrating the learning. <laughs> they're not trying. This is their active resistance, which is actually, you know, to my demise and to the demise of a bunch of students. So you don't get any more patient talks. Now you get teacher mm -hmm. Lorena, right? Mm -hmm. Who's gonna have to teach you a couple. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know what, this is a person who ha who is problematic, but they go back and forth and I see that they're, they're growth in some areas and they're wrestling through some stuff, right? So I think there's just discernment, like knowing where folks are at as much as you can and understanding the context, like what's, you know, like if something happens in private, it's not the same as if it happens in a board meeting or in front of the, in the school assembly. So context mm -hmm. matters too, right? Like, and, and so it's complicated, but that's why squad is necessary, right? That's why you, you're in that assembly and you just look over at Zakia and Zakia's like, mm, with the <laughs> harmonica, like, <laughs> and you're like, it ain't just me, okay, right? Um, <laughs> that's why, you know, I was talking, I don't remember where I was, but I was talking to someone about the fact that like, no matter, I was talking to, we're not talking to Jose, I think I was, like, no matter where I go, I find my people. Mm. You know, I'm here for a day at a conference, cool. I'm gonna find somebody here. Like, I'm gonna have my person here at some point, mm -hmm. right? you know what I mean? Um, or I don't go to certain spaces if I'm like, I don't got people here. Well, guess what? That you're not gonna get me here, you know? Um, because I, I don't know what the intentions are here. I don't know what the energy is here. And if some of my people ain't here, then maybe it's not a place for me, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That goes back to how we started the day with the tables, right? And there's some places where maybe we just don't need to be because yeah. it's not for us. Um, the teacher of the year, the intergalactic teacher, Miss yeah. Juliana, <laughs> yeah. talks about um, gardens as an equalizer. Mm -hmm. And that makes me think some about your interdisciplinary point. Okay. Um, and I'm just wondering if you have any examples of textured teaching with that pillar or, or that point of being interdisciplinary the interdisciplinary that excites you that you have seen, or maybe an example from the book that you'd like to share. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. I mean, I think it's just so fun to dream. First of all, <laughs> to dream about like, wow, let's come up with some lesson. Let's come up with some units. But um, some of what I've discussed already as I've been doing some PD with different schools is, you know, finding, 
some of what I talk about in that in that particular chapter is I talk about you know using a book as a place to do some of that interdisciplinary work and finding the moments, um, learning how to in a story find like you know what this could be a really interesting mathematical study or like mm -hmm. wait a minute this is a really interesting you know point of scientific study um, mm -hmm. you know and so let me think real quick. Um, Oh my God, because if I'm on the spot, I can't think about it, but I promise you, I wrote about 10,000 words. <laughs> <laughs> we believe you. We believe you. You don't um, have to prove it. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Um, you know, I've talked about different, the way I've done it with like so many different books, but you know, I'll just go back to that that Huck Finn example. And it's funny that I'm even talking about Huck Finn because I don't even teach that anymore, but that's the one that's coming to mind. Um, you know, and I talked about how we went to the river and we had a whole study there, a little bit about like some marine life. And I, I had our science teacher join us to talk to us about like, what could they have been smelling? What kinds of food maybe may have been around there? And, and then, you know, at the intersection of like, yeah, and he's also a formerly enslaved person. So what's the, what's his mobility like on these shores? And just in that way, right. Helping them understand that even though this is a story about this little boy, supposedly, this is actually so much more than just that. Mm -hmm. Right. And how all of a sudden we can actually have a conversation about food justice. Right, like that's going to come up when you have conversations about access to food and issues of race. Mm -hmm. And we could then have a conversation about what that was looking like in Austin, mm -hmm. where you have some of the worst segregation that I have ever seen in person. I also have not mm -hmm. been to Portland and I hear things, but I don't know. But I know that in Austin, the segregation is, is quite literally a life and death situation right now. Mm -hmm. You know, the side of the city where I lived. We, le we legitimately had no hospitals because they were all on the west side where the white folks are. Mm -hmm. So when you get into these conversations, they lead to others. And that's what I mean, that when you have this interdisciplinary conversation, it very naturally lends itself to um, having conversations about systems and how they work in mm -hmm. our surroundings. Mm -hmm. I think this also relates back to what Dr. Uh, Bettina said about infinite possibilities as opposed to zero sum game. If, if you approach it with the interdisciplinary lens, there are infinite possibilities That's right. of how students and us as yeah. uh, students and educators and parents in the community can learn um, together. Um, I mean, I can keep asking questions. It looks like the people are um, overwhelmed with the blessings today. It's a lot. It's a long day. <laughs> um, Lorena, as a mom, mm -hmm. oh, I know, isn't it? Isn't it though? I'll tell you, I'm actually not a biological mom. I have a lot of nieces and nephews. I have a lot of children in my mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, I'm just feeling mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. as, as we are scared about the CRT bans and we're scared about um, how our kids are treated. As a mom, um, mm -hmm. Could you share, you, you did so well in your presentation, but as we um, get ready to wrap up, I think, could you share how you're dreaming for your children mm. specifically? Are you trying to end it with some tears is what you're doing? Well, you see, I really struggle. <laughs> I'm thinking about my, my, my babies. My yeah. Babies. Right. No, I mean, it's hard. It's so hard. This is why Jose says that the, the personal is, you know, the political is personal, the personal is political, because there is no mm -hmm. distinction when my very being is cause for you to pass legislation, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Like, mm -hmm. so, you know, we can't talk about y'all suspending black girls more than anybody else. We can't talk about it, but we could just do it. That's fine, we'll just do it. <laughs> it is a forced silence. Right, it's like shut up and just take it, and so that is really hard. I've been touring schools for the past couple of weeks um, as we're trying to figure out where our kids are going to go now that we're in Tampa, mm -hmm. and you know, 
we did a tour and I asked, okay, so can you tell me a little bit about, I mean, I knew the answer is Akia, right? But like, I wanna at least ask, I want you to surprise me. It's that little tiny inkling mm -hmm. of hope of like, oh, I'm, you know, oh, I, I didn't realize you didn't, you didn't know to tell me. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how, can you talk to me a little bit about, and I kept it very easy with the general lingo. I said, can you tell me, you know, any work that your teachers are doing around diversity? Couldn't be any easy softball. Soft as far as you can. <laughs> okay. She was like, we talk a lot about poverty. I was like, oh. okay, okay, cool. Got it. I see where you are. Fantastic. You tell me everything I need to do. Right? <laughs> um, anyway, that's just an example of of, of the struggle, right? Of, of not just, because it's not as simple as being a teacher who's a parent and trying to do this. It's also about like, like will your teachers know not to kick my son out, out their class when he's doing the same stuff though the white boys are doing? Mm -hmm. Am I going to have to come in here and do a forced PD? Like, how, what are we doing? You know? Mm -hmm. And so the fears and the anxieties and the stress is also one of those, uh, uh, one of those motivating factors, unfortunately. Right? Like, I wish it didn't all come from pain. And it, and it doesn't. There are de there's definitely joy in here. But, but a lot, there's a lot of pain. There's a lot of trauma. There's a lot of hurt that education has done to us, that it has been for us, uh, mm -hmm. you know, for generations. I mean, Zakia, we are digging up remains. Correct. We are currently in the process throughout this country and Canada of digging up remains. That should be enough. That should be enough for there to be a mass, like national reform of education, but it's not. And so what does this feel like? It feels like all those things, the, the heaviness, and the vastness of all of that is on my mind daily. It is why I do the work that I do. And it is also why I, I, why I feel anxieties and stress and, and all these feelings when I think about my own babies, quite literally, going into these, these women's hands, you know? So it's, it's, I don't even know if I answered your question, but that's all the things that are happening in my mind, you know? It's like, yeah, I'm sure you can teach her how to spell really well, but will she learn from you that she can do anything right, literally that she wants? Will she know that she can come in here and that speaking Spanish is a beautiful and wonderful thing and that you're going to nurture it and support her? Mm -hmm. Is she going to know that when she comes in here and somebody wants to touch her hair, that it is okay for her to smack that hand mm -hmm. and that she will not get in trouble? Mm -hmm. Like, will he know that his hyperactivity, I'm giving it a name, but he's a regular energy little boy. But like, will, is it going to be okay in here or am I going to get phone calls? when the little white boys are doing the same thing, you know? So right. those things are on my mind every day. I hear you saying, Lorena, uh, to mention our uh, National Teacher of the Year again, that you would like as a mom and, and the rest of us who care so much about children in our lives, you'd, you'd like for your kids to be able to show up and kind of rest and just you. learn and be excited. Let me tell to, you something. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you something. I, for the first time about seven years, ago, six years ago, taught at a private, a white private, predominantly white private school, okay, mm -hmm. in Austin. It was my first time ever being like in that kind of setting. And I recently in moving found this journal that I had from that first year. And it was like three months in that I wrote this short little piece where I, I should have, I should have brought it, but I reflected and I was like, these kids walk around without a care in the world. Sometimes, and I even itemize like what it was that I was seeing. Sometimes they'll walk around with their shoelaces untied. Their backpack strap is open. They, lo they left their computer over there. They can't find their water bottle. Mommy shows up with the thing that they needed and they are free, free, mm -hmm. free. And it was that in, that mo in, in those moments that I understood the stark difference between their aloofness and the setting that I was coming from, which was not the case. Right, you better hold on to your stuff before somebody takes it. You better hold on to those sneakers because your mother just bought those and you're not getting no more for like at least another year. At least. And so, right, and so the freedom, the, the relaxation, the looseness, if you will, 
the, the good kind, I guess. I don't know if they're the bad kind, whatever. Mm -hmm. that, I, that I saw and observed was very impactful for me. And that's, I, I want my kids to be able to walk around like that just fine. Yes, yes. Lorena, we have one last question. Uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna edit it a little bit. <laughs> How do you navigate professional association spaces and bringing this energy and action to reluctant folks? Especially, this is the key is addendum. If you kind of just feel a knuck if you buck, like all the time. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Uh, well, I don't participate in, to my fullest in professional organizations and where I don't think I can, there's a space for me, mm. right? So if like, okay, this or this organization, I'm not gonna say names, but this, this one organization is not as open. They're not doing this type of work. They're not wrestling through these things. Okay, I may still participate, but you all getting me on a limited. Like I'm not gonna be on the New York committees. Like I might do a panel. <laughs> I might do a little talk here and there, but you don't get me the way some of these other ones do. And so if these other ones are making that space, right, are openly trying to do some of this work, then you'll you'll get me at my fullest and, and we're going to wrestle through all that that means. Um, and you push and you shove and you have goals, right? You got short term ones and long term ones and you make decisions. You're going to have to compromise here and there, right? Like, OK, I'm going to keep I'm going to keep this one, but y'all going to give me those two. OK, then. Right. And so there's that, you know, there's that, that if you are so inclined to do that work, because you don't have to do that work. Yeah. Other people can do it. That's a choice. Right. It is a choice. And so mm -hmm. if you make that choice, then you're going to have to deal with the way that that choice needs to be worked through. You know, that's the short, <laughs> that's the short version of that answer. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for shining your light, for blessing us. Thank you for the fashion ministry you have presented us today with those earrings. Hey, y'all, listen, don't wait. Which one is this one? Don't sleep, okay? Do not. Do not. <laughs> uh, we're so excited about your book. Uh, many of us have already pre-ordered. I will be pre-ordering this weekend. Um, <laughs> I think I think this is it. If there's anything you want to say in closing, you can, but I think we're done. Oh, my. Anything in closing. Thank you all for being here. Um, you know, this this summit is, is one of those tables that Deidre talked about. You know, mm -hmm. I just want to refresh people's memories. This came about when several of us got rejected elsewhere. And we said, we don't need y'all conference. We're gonna do our own through EduColor. And here we are. Mm -hmm. and, and so for those organizations that don't welcome you, that's all right, walk away. There's, there's more, there's more out there for us. There's so much more. There is so much more. Um, if it's okay, Jose, I'll just add in closing that uh, Lorena mm -hmm. and I, and Jose actually have been talking about what it means to collectively resist the things that are happening as pertains to CRT. We're particularly interested in supporting educators in the classroom, like in Tennessee, who are getting fired and in other places. So um, if you're interested in this, in this sort of collective um, building work, um, reach out to us, let us know, and we'll keep you in the loop. Yes, stay tuned. There will be a message from me. <laughs> We can't hear you, Jose, because you want yeah, Everyone, please show some love. Show some love on the chat uh, for Zakia Jackson and the incomparable Lorena Herman. Uh, she, she, y'all, y'all, y'all playing small again. Stop doing that. Like you're about to release a book. <laughs> like people are gonna now know you across the country. The galaxy. The galaxy. The <laughs> galaxy. <laughs> A couple galaxies away, maybe. And to the dark matter, they're gonna know who you are. So you know you gotta be ready for those tweets from outer space. Um, please, uh, in the chat, show some love, show you people love, because our folks never get as much love as they deserve. So you know, let me just put that out there for people. And of course, this concludes the EduColor Summit. I want to thank everybody for coming in, all the you beautiful panelists, all the moderators, all the keynote speakers. In addition, of course, I would love to thank um, 
our sponsors, Cabral Co., System and Foundation, Greater Than Five, uh, the Expectations Project, uh, 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 and the News Literacy Project. And of course, of, of course, of course, of course, I love to thank the team. And I, I, they, they may not reveal themselves, but that's all right. Um, Yamil Baez, thank you so much for being you. Uh, Julia Torres, I see you out there. And of course, uh, Hema Kodai, uh, shout outs to y'all. And of course, too, uh, because we never shout out our families enough, I want to thank uh, Luz Maria Rojas Wilson and Alejandro Wilson for putting up with me today, amongst all the things that we always do. Everyone, there's a poem by Langston Hughes that I'm going to paraphrase, and that is to say that um, America has all these different things that it espouses, supposedly. We are going to hold this country accountable by stepping both feet into the work. We will not fear. We will not be afraid because our communities and our ancestors are so much stronger than that. In a land that uh, pretends to have started in 1776, but really it started ages and ages ago with the, well, the land that I'm on, the Nape people, and any number of indigenous people whose lands were stolen and plundered from them, from people who built this land that were stolen from their uh, continents and all across the world. And, you know, any number of marginalized people who were eventually pulled into this American experiment, we will hold America accountable in the way that it needs to be. We will make sure that all of our babies feel the work that we've put into them because our ancestors have put in so much work to get us to the point where we're at now. We will find ways to discuss liberation that allows for all of us to get free because even those rich white folk need that liberation too so they can come off our backs. We will get that liberation, we will get that justice, especially as our children continue to depend on it in education, especially as we keep moving forward in this country. There is not a bill in the world that's gonna stop us from doing the work that we need to do for so many of our children. And so when I ask you and I implore everybody here to ensure that you're doing what you need to do. Those classrooms are not for you to be isolated in. They are for you to build a concrete and long web of educators from all across the country and all across the world who are trying to find this true shared humanity for everybody. And we will teach everybody how to be more just and more joyful, more human. Make sure that those power levers are pulled in the ways that they need to so that everybody can get the work that they deserve to get the education they deserve and we get to be a part of that we will show up big in all the places that make us look small we will show up um large huge with big voices big community big energy in places that continue to try to push us back that do not love us back we will hold them accountable we will they will love us back they must there is no other way to do this. And so I wanna thank you as executive director of EduColor, but also as a longtime educator, as a black man, as someone who uh, loves and shares wholeheartedly, vulnerably, right? All the joys and pain that you know so many of us go through and try to embody that in the works that I do. I wanna thank you all for coming through to this EduColor Summit. Uh, I hope you all tune in. There's, I'm gonna leave this, <laughs> I'm gonna leave this platform open to everybody who wants to continue to uh, converse in the chat. Yes, abundance indeed, Annie, and keep it going. Much love to everybody. Have a great day.